because that you cannot call any kind of API. At all. That's another reason that you cannot call any external services. That's why it's not out there. Do you know why you cannot call any kind of other service? Theory? In some predictable way, yeah. Basically, where does you have a, I have a smart contract, so I have the byte code, and then I call one of the functions in, in that. Okay? So when I call this smart contract, what I'm doing is I'm sending a transaction where the data is the call. I'm sending the transaction to the smart contract, and in the data section, I'm putting the call I'm doing. But then this code has to execute in all the Ethereum that's in the world. Everyone having a so all the miners that will execute it and, and all other uh, nodes will verify it. So everyone will execute it. And if we don't have the same result, the same result in all the computers in the world, the transaction will, won't go through. So we need to have the same result. Imagine you have an, an API to check for the price of oil. I don't know. Just, so probably the same call to the API for different parts of the world will, will get a different result. So probably the result of the smart contract will be different. So it has to be deterministic. And of course, you have a few more problems of security problems. So that's one of the reasons that the smart contract it's always something close. The other way to interact with the smart contract is sending an oracle. Then anyone that like, okay, you can interact with this smart contract, and then uh, they have to start the execution and then start that the auto execution. But the main thing is like what I'm saying with the smart contract. And probably it's the thing that you have to understand that basically uh, comparison will be like, okay, I'm installing uh, my program in internet. Not in a server, not on Heroku, not on Amazon Web Service, not well, everywhere. So uh, for me, Ethereum basically it's like some kind of operating system for the internet. And it allows me to install something everywhere around. And that's something that I'm installing in smart contract. Be really careful, there's a lot of people losing a lot of money because they didn't know how to deploy smart contract. You know, yesterday we were talking about that. Uh, we have a, 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 we are doing classes about uh, Solidity Ethereum. And yesterday we had some one, white hacker, it's called by Lina, pretty good at that. So basically he was telling all the, the security issues with uh, Ethereum smart contracts. There are a lot of them, a lot of them. And if you're not careful, a lot of millions of dollars has been lost so far. Just because of small mistakes in the in the code. Because once you install this software, this smart code uh, on the internet, no way you can just get back. That's not true. You have uh, open separate <coughs> tools, and then you can create contracts. But it's complicated. So at at some point you have to be great. It's a smart contract. I will install it. This will go forever. Okay. Yeah. You know what a smart contract is. It's been really brief interruption. I told you. You want to know more? You can come to the master. <laughs> so yeah, <coughs> ready? You understand? Yeah, you you can answer you. Yeah. Hey, how are yours? Hey, uh, one thing. Uh, do we have an adapter for this for uh, MacBook Air? Yeah, I guess. So uh, does anyone of you have a problem that this is being live streamed? <laughs> uh, so first of all, sorry for the delay. Like it was a bit difficult to find the place uh, in the first place. But um, my name is Eric Fostet. I'm the Nation Street Ambassador. And uh, until we can show the presentation and other things, and also one of our developers will be here, um, or will be here via uh, Hangouts to explain a little bit more about our code. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, BitNation and our, uh, how I got into BitNation. So um, I'm already working for almost half a year for BitNation, but before that, I was a volunteer. And um, I got into it because um, I really thought it's an interesting um, project to to realize um, ideas, let's say, political ideas that would be impossible in the current legislation that we have or in the, in the democratic system that we have. Because you essentially vote for a new party every four years, but you don't change how um, the social contract itself works. And if you really want to have a new jurisdiction, you will have to create islands, you will have to occupy unoccupied land, which is almost inexistent anymore in this world. Uh, and yeah, 
because all of these reasons, I was convinced that um, the virtual opt-out through uh, crypto cryptography and blockchain is something um, that we, we should all try out and see how it works. So uh, first of all, I need to find my um, slides. Yes. Is the audio working? Let's see. Right, so uh, just to start, I want to show a video. Let's see if the audio works. It was the Pangea super continent. Since then, the world has been divided by tectonic shifts, widening oceans, and cyclone politics. Nation states are crumbling under the weight of local and global challenges that they see incapable of solving. Rather than embracing a borderless world and increasing personal freedoms, governments and multilateral organizations have overseen a surge in bureaucracy, protectionism, and ever greater intrusions into our personal lives. To prevent a drift towards tyranny, we need drastic change. Pangea is BitNation's decentralized jurisdiction platform. Using Pangea, you can build voluntary nations, agree contracts, and resolve disputes with other citizens, and access the services you need. This is our vision of Jurisdiction as a Service, a global market for governance services. The Pangea Arbitration Token, or PAT, is an Ethereum-based in-app token that powers the Pangea platform. When you create a contract, complete a contract, or resolve a dispute on Pangea, you receive non-tradable reputation tokens through Lucy, our AI bot. Accumulating reputation tokens earns you tradable PAT tokens. This ensures that you can't buy a good reputation or acquire it through popularity, but if you earn one, you will be rewarded. Imagine a world where people can freely choose which voluntary nations and jurisdictions they want to be part of. A world where voluntary nations offer a choice of services under their own laws and policies and compete for citizens in a free market that rewards good governance. You too can be part of the future of governance by joining the Pangea token sale. Welcome to the Internet of Sovereignty. Welcome to Pangea. Uh, so the token sales over already, and I'm not making any ICO advertisement or anything like this. Don't be uh, worried about that. Um, I want to just uh, before we uh, go over to to the actual uh, code, I just wanted to mention like why this is something worth um, to to invest your time in and like yeah to start coding because um, like here in this quote, Cody Wilson said that basically. Um, instead of going years and years for a political career to try to change the system from within, um, you could simply, um, yeah, build a new model through through software and allow people to, to opt out, to switch to a new uh, to a new paradigm, basically, without having to, to fight inside of the existing system. So um, instead of um, yeah fighting all the time in, in this political system, you could just. Uh, use our energy and time to to build something better and to to allow people to just choose which system they like the best. And um, yeah, basically the the question that we pose with BitNation is: with, if you would like to choose your governance services the same way you choose your phone provider, so instead of having to uh, leave your country, leave behind your your family, culture, family, uh, like everything, just to switch from one governance provider to another one should be just like you uh, use one insurance company or the other or like you like you choose uh, just an app basically on the app store it should be just as easy to opt into a new uh, virtual governance service provider so um, to make this uh, brief I just um, want to go to um, one part that's um, it's like the most relevant right now which is the um, software that we create so um, basically, 
The software that we built is called Pangea. You can already find it on the Google Play Store. It's an app. And um, it allows you to um, create agreements on the blockchain uh, without <laughs> having to go through, through the traditional um, notary services that you have today. And uh, also, it's, it's, much, it's much more convenient. And also, it has a built-in arbitration market. So you will not have to uh, go through a very costly, um, let's say, court uh, procedure and process like you, you have today. But uh, you will have a market of competing arbitrators who, who try to offer real value and so will work for reputation. So instead of uh, judges who will have to basically, yeah, who will uh, work as they do right now until they retire. Um, here you have a market that is actually uh, demand oriented. And in the existing system that we have, it's a monopoly. You, you cannot opt out. You have to accept the way it works. And uh, yeah, if you want to change anything, you will have to leave the country. You will just have to um, yeah, uh, comply with another monopoly service. And uh, further, you will be able to create and join virtual nations. And here the idea is that people, um, yeah, based on, on Solidity smart contracts, build their own uh, nation services. And here nation is not the concept that we have today of the nation state. It's more like individual government services. So instead of having the whole package of services that we have today, like in the government, um, we would have uh, notaries, uh, marriage provider, like marriage service provider, um, people who can notarize land titles, um, or simply, yeah, physical things like trash collection or, um, I don't know, peer-to-peer -peer defense. So all the things that governments offer as a bulk service right now could be individually uh, uh, provided on the blockchain by competing, uh, is, let's say, uh, DApps, decentralized applications. And um, yeah, to just give you a brief idea of how uh, these kind of agreements that we already uh, want to provide on this app work, uh, you first of all look for any kind of counterparty for whatever business you were doing. You can just take what you were doing already today, be it in the black market or be it as a, as a normal job, as a freelancer, for example. Uh, you could do this uh, as you would do it on WhatsApp today. You would just uh, take it on our uh, messaging service. And there, through, through a chatbot that will uh, lead you basically through this process, you will generate a smart contract. And you will either choose an existence smart contract template or will, you will create your own, your own law. So this is something that we offer that no one else offers. Uh, you can customize the law uh, based on your needs. And um, yeah, any kind of law that you can imagine could be offered on this platform. It could be common law, civil law, Sharia law, UN law, or yeah, some things just specifically uh, that you need in your industry. And uh, the arbitrator that you choose will also be um, yeah, knowledgeable in this field. And um, yeah, then you sign the contract, you timestamp it. I think most of you heard before of how that works. You, you basically create the hash of that document that you signed. And later on, you can prove the authenticity of this document by repeating the same process and the same hash has to be created again. If anything is fake in this contract, there will be a different hash. And then you can point to this. Uh, timestamp. And um, the most interesting parts of these are the escrow and the dispute resolu uh, resolution. So um, in order to make sure that your counterparty is not going to run away with the money that you pay him in advance, uh, you will lock this money in an escrow. So you will have uh, maybe two out of three multi-state wallets, so you will need two out of three private keys to access these funds. Um, if only one party says, uh, I'm right, this is my money, he will not be able to just take it. Uh, either uh, the agreement was good and both parties agree, uh, then the provider of a specific service can just uh, use the two keys and take the money. But if there's a dispute, um, they will need the, uh, the opinion of the arbitrator. He will hold the th a third key. So um, he will have to follow up, let's say, with the whole process. You will have to decide and make a good judgment because he will also be, um, yeah, rated by by, by his uh, customers. Um, so we will have to decide whether the money should be rolled back or if, if the service was actually provided. And um, yeah, so that's the built-in arbitration and the whole process. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, um, William now will also go more into that, but uh, we're using the uh, Ethereum blockchain for most of the things from the beginning, but uh, we have a multi-blockchain approach that means um, we're creating a mesh network that can be integrated with many blockchains. So we will uh, start with Ethereum, but uh, we can later on also timestamp on other blockchains, and people who create agreements will then be able to choose on which blockchain they would like to operate. So, but for now, we use smart contracts on Ethereum with Solidity. Um, we have the uh, escrow, the tokens, and the uh, timestamps on the Ethereum blockchain. But um, we are building our own ID and reputation system. And um, we are also building our own AI bots, the Lucy bot, uh, that will also help us to search uh, data on the IPFS network. Um, yeah, to just give you an idea of what kind of chains we could also integrate, it could be Bitcoin through the Rooster protocol, uh, it could be Lisk to open up the whole space for uh, JavaScript developers, it could be um, future projects like uh, EOS, Eternity, even post-blockchain uh, projects like Hashgraph or BitLattice. But um, basically, um, yeah, I think I can skip this for now. I will go too much into the details. Um, about the mesh network, I think one thing uh, that I should still mention, uh, we're not only operating off-chain, because this uh, mesh network works independently from blockchains, and the data that we hold there is private, so it will not be uh, published like on a, on a public ledger. For example, if you are a dissident and your information will be on a public blockchain, this is very dangerous for you, actually. So we want to provide our citizens the security that they can operate in a pseudonymous manner without being uh, retaliated by their governments. Uh, but further than being just off-chain, it's also working offline. So uh, using the gossip protocol um, and, and yeah, basically how, how mesh networks and cells work. You can, for example, install antennas in a, in a village in Ghana, for example, so people with no internet access could, even though they have no internet, but based on the smartphone that they already have there, uh, engaged in peer-to-peer -peer agreements. And um, yeah, basically already create this web of trust, create um, yeah, new, new standards, let's say, that operates as the, as the uh, counter economy uh, against the corruption in their current government. Uh, and they would have actually a new kind of security, legal security that they didn't have before. Um, because before they were mostly operating in the gray and black markets, but now uh, they could do the, things, the same things on the blockchain and create their own jurisdictions and have everything uh, like on the, on the open, open ledger. Um, and yeah, to just give you a brief outlook on all of the dApps that could be built on top of all of this. So it could be, um, like um, Alex mentioned before, it could be smart love, marriage dApps, could be land titles, dispute resolution, uh, birth certificates, peer-to-peer uh, -peer security, uh, even the basic income protocol, which I think is a very interesting idea, but yeah, everything is opt-in, so no one's forced to use any of these. Um, business and cooperation, like with Aragon, for example, uh, insurance, health insurance, unemployment insurance, um, and yeah, so basically it's open to your imagination which kind of services you want to provide that were only provided as a monopoly until now. And we, we're opening up a new market, basically, that didn't exist before. It's the market for governance. And because um, all of this is on an open ledger and all of this is open source, uh, it cannot be destroyed by governments. Like, uh, the, the idea is already out there. We also do everything open source because we want people to uh, focus, to create competition. We, we need competition to, uh, let's say, uh, prove the market. And um, I think in, in general the time has come that people realize that the existing system is not going to make people, it's not going to make them happy. I mean, you can see with Brexit, you can see with Trump, you can see in the European Union that um, even though right now we, we think that democracy is the way to go, like it's the, it's the tyranny of the majority, basically. And in order to give everyone an opportunity to try out something new, we, we need some alternatives. And this is basically the playing field. So you can try out uh, new constitutions, new systems, uh, virtual communities, um, virtual nations. So um, basically, I would like to go over now to William's part. Um, 
William, are you there? Uh, yeah, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. No. <laughs> you can't hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, we can hear you. OK, perfect. Um, OK, so I'm just here to give you guys an idea of what dApps will be and what they'll look like. So uh, at the end of the day, the dApp is basically a dApp, uh, as some of you know, is just a Solidity backend with um, with the front end written in something like React or something like that. So what we are looking to offer is, so when you create a dApp, you'll create like two sides of it. One side will be a simple, like it can be a very simple Solidity application, like that just sells a certain item to uh, certain people. And then the fun part is the part that you would use to interact with this. So what we're hoping to do is that we're hoping to make a JavaScript virtual machine inside our uh, mobile application that you can write a front end in using something like React. And then we'll give you a certain space to show your front end in. And then we'll pass in certain um, functions to help you sign certain transactions with the user on the mobile application. And that would let you uh, use the user's mobile application to sign um, certain transactions and let them interact with your Solidity smart contract. So I don't know if that makes sense, but basically you would basically write a front end that we would show inside our mobile application that would let uh, our users use your Solidity application. So I don't know if anyone has any questions about that or if it was too quick. Um, I think it would be great if you could just uh, share your screen so we can see a little bit of the code and to yeah to get a bit yes. Um, okay, so basically, uh, if you guys can see this, this is basically a super simple uh, Solidity contract that would just ideally sell a single product to anyone that wants to buy it. So you expose a couple of functions into it and. Basically, you would deploy this to um, the Ethereum network, and you would just uh, so this super simple smart contract, right? Just as a demo, and then the other side of it would be you write a React application, a small React application that would interface with it and call the various functions based on how, whatever aesthetic that you want. So you would design it however you want, and then we would give you a specific space inside our mobile applications that users can visit and interact with your smart contract. So we'll pass in functions that uh, that would sign your transactions. So if you get your users to click a button that says buy item, for example, and then you, 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 you generate a transaction object that says that you want to buy this item and you need to get assigned by the user that clicked the button, we would pass in, a, uh, pass in a function that would let you sign it with the user's private key. And that would pop up a modal. And then we would handle all of that for you. And then once that is ready, will give you back the signed transaction. You can just send that to the um, network using something like a provider like Infura. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any examples of that side of it because that's still being developed. It's still in a very young proof of concept stage. But uh, this is what we have right now. But uh, very soon, we'll be able to get that out to you guys. And we'll have it on our website or something like that. And you guys can check it out. Yeah. And um, how can people like start to contribute if they if they would like to build a dApp? Um, so it's a little bit young right now, but after maybe like next month, we have we'll be, we'll be writing out uh, certain specifications as to how you can use these functions and how you can write uh, your your applications for our system. And then once we have that spec out there, people can just read the documentation and then really get their hands on. Um, approach to like developing their own dApps that would we would host on our platform. OK, so that will be a tech spec. And um, when when can we expect the open API? Ideally, the sometime uh, next month uh, or sometime middle of this month. Yeah, we're just kind of finishing it up right now. So it's, uh, it's hard to hard to like for me to demo it or something like that. But like very soon, I would say late this month or early next month. And um, do you already know which kind of dApps are already going to are going to be available on the uh, next on this month's release, like on the end of this on the end of this month? 
at the end of this month, we're hoping we're going to start off really simple. So we're going to start off with a, with a dApp that would just um, send Ether from one account to the other, just as a like a like a proof of concept as you may. So like um, uh, we'd have that and then we'd have our four basic um, smart contracts. For example, the one time purchase we'll have an auction um, contract that you can use. Uh, we'll have a subscription model and yeah, we'll have those three and then we'll have the send ether from one account to the other just as um, demo like dApps so that people have an example to refer to when they want to develop their own applications. And um, what kind of uh, yeah, specific functions will this enable? Like now, for example, for nations. Um, okay, so when it comes out, we'll just be these will kind of be standalone. But later on, we hope to like have a more tighter integration with our nations platform, so that you can, you know, maybe check if a person is part of a citizen. You can offer DApps for the citizens of your nation, or uh, you know, uh, like the possibilities are much more available once we have uh that out um and what kind of uh let's say languages should one know in order to be able to contribute okay so you need to know uh solidity obviously to be able to write the smart contracts but that's not too hard to learn it's a pretty simple language but to uh for the front end we're hoping to let you write it in react which is a pretty popular front end framework so you can just I'm sure many people are familiar with this. So you can just write a React front end, and then we would just host that up in our virtual machine inside our application. So React and Solidity, pretty simple. OK. Yeah, that's the gist of it. Um, yes? How, how do you deal with, uh, with the gaps? And, uh, questions. and then how do you plan which, which standard you plan to use for digital ID? Uh, did you hear the questions? Uh, no, could you just repeat it? Okay. Um, so first of all, how do we deal with the gas? I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean. How do we deal with the gas? <laughs> like, does everybody needs to have gas to interact with smart contracts? Yeah. So uh, in order to interact with the contracts, does one need to spend gas? Well, yeah, like it's pretty simple knowledge that you would always need to have pay the gas fee, right? And that's um, okay. So I, I I'm assuming you're asking a question about the gas price and how we deal with that but basically when you whenever we you know remember when i mentioned that we pass in functions for you to be able to sign a transaction that function would actually take care of showing a modal to the user that would let them set their own gas price from a range from like two guay to like a hundred guay and then they would just choose on the slider maybe they want to pay like 12 guay as a gas price and then that would take care of that for you Okay. So that's not something you can set inside the DAP or else that can be easily abused, right? I mean, all of the users, they need to have gas and effort. They want it actually to interact with, uh, with the smart contracts. Yeah, so uh, yeah, their wallet would need to have <laughs> Ether inside it to be able to interact with any smart contract, yes. And then digital ID, how do you reach yeah. the standard? Did you hear the question? Uh, sorry, could you just repeat that one? Yes. Um, how how um, do we create the digital IDs? You mean the private key? Um, probably. No, like, no, I mean, the solutions like Uport, first one, LC75, all these different solutions for digital ID. Um, yeah, if, you, if we're using Uport or um, ERC25, what? 75. So. ERC twenty seventy five um, or yeah, like which which solution are we using? Um, I'm not too sure what you mean because when a user just opens our application, it's it's pretty anonymous. We don't really keep track of stuff like that. They just we just help them generate a private key, and that's their persona. Uh, their, that's their account on the Ethereum network. Right? We're not keeping track of anything more than that. So there is no like authentication of. Uh, for the moment, it's completely pseudonymous. And how do you recover uh, your identity if you lose it? Yeah, uh, how, how does one recover his identity if one loses it? Lose so it? your identity on our platform is just your Ethereum key, right? And when you create that, we really suggest you to back it up somehow. But if you if you do 
lose it, right? There's nothing we can do about it because that's just the inherent property of the of the Ethereum platform, right? You lose your private key, you lose your identity on the Ethereum network. That's just how it works, I guess. Uh, and can one, for example, create like a passphrase or something like this? Or um, uh, yeah, so our application, just to help users out, we would uh, allow them to just create a six-digit passcode for their application. That would take care of it. So it's a very basic security. But if you choose to use that option, we we offer that to you. Okay. Um. Yeah. Any more questions? Or how do you plan to make this scalable? Yeah, uh, how, how do we plan to make this scalable? Um, it doesn't really need to be scalable, right? Because we're taking advantage of the uh, Ethereum network. And basically, well, like it's it's part of our mobile application, right? So once you build your front end, we'd able, be able to insert that into each user's uh, like mobile phone, right? I don't really see a problem with scalability. It's not like we have a server in the background trying to handle all the requests. Yeah, but even if the server handles of the of the request, they can of course put in, you know, you have a limit amount of transactions, mm. and then it can cost it can cost a lot of gas. So actually, it could become pretty expensive, and and not being able to process a lot of the transactions. So are you planning planning to use something like Plasma, maybe, or, or Child Chain, or? Uh, yeah. So the problem is, of course, the transaction fees. Um, yeah, that's why that's why we we're designed to be like blockchain agnostic, right? We could eventually like right now Ethereum can handle whatever we're we're willing to throw at it right now. But if at one day it becomes a problem, we'll just switch to the next best solution. So we'll just go with Ethereum as long as it's still good, and then we. Yeah, choose I think the Ethereum is more than viable for what we're trying to do right now. Do you guys have an expectation about uh, mass adoption? Um, so right now, this is still in the in the uh, alpha release, and for the beta release, we will uh, go for for mass adoption. So right now, it's still for uh, crypto early adopters, but um, we're we're planning to make this uh, much more intuitive. Uh, so you can just create smart contract templates for emojis, for example. Um, and yeah, it should be working with uh, with uh, chatbots who will help you to set everything up. So that should become much much more easier than it is right now. I know that right now many people are struggling with um, creating the wallets. Even like many times uh, there are some some uh, errors with the seeds or uh, yeah, like people who don't even know how to store their their private keys and so on. Uh, so we need to make this uh, much more intuitive and, and easier for people to use to be able to scale. Yeah. Okay. And how is the decision making or governance inside the? the, the for example, if we, we say that um, ID, it's better if you have like an identity. Like, uh, so how is the decision making inside Bitnation? So um, for the moment, it's still quite uh, <laughs> centralistic with uh, Suzanne Tarkovsky Temple mm -hmm. or founder. But uh, the idea is to become holocratic and that um, anyone can just, you know, uh, create their own holon and also get parts of the funds and uh, that it will eventually become sort of like a DAO. Like just to start everything up, like in every startup, you need more or less, yeah, uh, dictatorial leadership to, yeah. to get the software going. But uh, we're aiming to, to actually become really decentralized. Um, and also that's why like uh, everything's already open source. We, we only engage in partnerships with projects that are also, op also open source. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, no one wants to have another, you know, centralistic one world government or something like this. Not, like, no, no, no. We're enabling people to, to create their own uh, opt-out solutions. Uh, no one is forced to, to obey uh, to what Suzanne Tarkovsky Temple thinks or something like this. We're just creating software. Uh, we're providing tools for people to govern themselves. And uh, they don't have to be ideologically aligned with what the, the core team of BitNation thinks. Everyone can actually exercise their own ideas on a voluntary way inside of these nations. Uh, you, you can have like, I don't know, like a communist or capitalist or uh, I don't know, like a hippie nation, like you can have everything. Um, so you, you basically 
yeah, we, we just need to have like this a little bit more centralistic governance for the beginning to, to provide actual services. Mm -hmm. uh, but then like once it's more or less established, I think uh, we can just hand over control and just uh, let the community uh, vote on, on all the important decisions. Why do you need uh, the back token? So why do you need a, a token? Yeah, so the token is basically to fund the whole project. So we were already running on voluntary contributions for the first three years, basically. Uh, and I think it was quite nice, but in order to be scaled and to provide actual software to actual, um, like, tangible solutions, uh, we needed to change a little bit, to become just a little bit more corporate, even though we're still uh, much more, uh, like, yeah, loose and, and uh, free floating, let's say, than other projects. Um, but yeah, in any case, the token uh, is, of course, part of the um, incentivization um, system of, of, uh, of, the, of the Pangea. So uh, what I didn't show before in the slides is um, that for each of the parts of the app, uh, basically, you can earn reputation tokens. And the more reputation you earn, you will also earn tradable uh, pet tokens. That are now called uh, expat, by the way, because uh, the Patreon project already took the the pets um, abbreviation. So now we're expat. Um, but uh, in any case, this is just an ERC twenty token to, to power, let's say, the whole initiative. But it's not, uh, let's say, the the ultimate goal of of the project. No, it's it's about the actual uh, governance services that then, that will then be executed. So we're, we're just using this to create this whole infrastructure um, and also this um, like contract functionality that you've seen to create agreements. But uh, the long-term goal, I think uh, it's not so dependent. I mean, PET, it's a reflection of, our, um, of the value that we provide to, to society, basically. So the higher the price, of course, the more valuable this to people. And um, so it's also a, a good way to, to show, let's say, your commitment to the project. But it's, it's not like super, um, yeah, obligatory. I mean, for, for any of the functions on Pangea, you can choose which currency you want to accept. It's not an obligation to use pad tokens in order to interact with uh, anything or anyone on, on the system. And uh, so, for example, like regarding the governance system of the judges. So, for example, if I, I could create my uh, smart contract, I would, mm -hmm. like, I would like to be a marriage provider or whatever, right? And uh, then uh, there would be some kind of rules, and uh, in, like the gray area, I would, have, I would need another party to decide if I would not be happy with the, with the smart contract, right? So, like, how do I apply to the judges? Um. So, first of all, already when you create the contract, um, here, um, you already choose before you have any conflict will be your arbitrator. And um, basically, um, before I create the contract, I have to find the judges. Or in, in the process, like before you uh, look for the arbitrator, you first uh, have to find someone you want to do a business with. You don't find your counterparty, and um, you need to choose which kind of law you want to use. And then you choose the arbitrator based on that. So it's more like in, in this order. Uh, yeah, I think it, yeah. Do I, uh, like the arbitrators? Uh, these are the guys that decide, right? Uh, um, they only decide if there's a dispute. Yeah, exactly. If there's no dispute, they have no power whatsoever. Yeah. So in case of a uh, um, dispute, like, it's like, are you going to have some most people or like some kind of system deciding these disputes or do I have to put it there? So um, in general, like, it will also be possible to use third-party integrations like uh, crowd juries, like Cleros. Um, so instead of using individual arbitrators, you could also have a jury, like a jury system um, that is like much more, I don't know, democratic or based on, on many ideas and uh, many people. So you will use basically the wisdom of the crowd. Um, but it depends on, on the, on, I don't know how Claros is actually going to do it, but we're open for this kind of integrations as long as they're open source. Um, 
But so, like again, how how what is the problem you have? Sorry. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like you mentioned, uh, increase how, for example, players yeah. do it because um, of course, if I would um, be able to choose my uh, arbitrator, yeah, I could uh, choose a friend or someone who will always go uh, in my yeah. favor, and then it's basically ruining it. So um, the both of the parties have to agree who will be the arbitrator. Like, you cannot just. Uh, I mean. Also, uh, you as the counterparty should uh, do a background check of the arbitrator if there was any personal affiliation between the arbitrator and your. Uh, oh, this must be uh, the governance system must be in place because uh, I could uh, like just generate, uh, for example, like you said that the authentication is based on the private key, right? It's not uh, backed up by mm -hmm. a password, uh, which a uh, passport, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, which means. I could just uh, generate like several of my judges or arbitrators, suggest them uh, for the contract, and uh, you can't really uh, make sure to check on them because uh, I mean, they are traded You could just check uh, the public keys, yeah. You could have just a new uh, fake profile or a new exactly. pseudonymous ID. Yeah. The there, there is one um, idea on how to solve this problem. Uh, Joe Nigrin, who was not working for us, but who was a friend of us, let's say, he had the idea for uh, online pseudonymous parties. So uh, it's a way, even though, to have people who are pseudonymous to prove that they're individuals. They will have proof of individuality tokens. Um, and the, his idea as of now, I mean, it's, it's still not being developed, but I think it has a really good uh, mechanism. Like every month, people will have to, at the same time, everyone in the whole world at the same time will have to join uh, video calls. And it's always groups of four. And for 15 minutes, they have to verify each other that they're actual human beings. That's not an AI or some script or whatever. Um, and when they, they have to like accomplish some game, they will earn points in this game. And when they win the game uh, to prove that they're humans, um, they will get a proof of individu individuality token for one month. And uh, you would probably prefer people who have this token for your business. And um, they cannot have several of these tokens because they cannot be in several video chats at the same time. Because it's like a, a like random algorithm that puts you into this room and it's all at the same time. Uh, and it will be like cryptographically encrypted, so you will not be able to, to hack this or to put yourself into several rooms at the same time. Um, but yes, it's, a, it's an important point. Uh, there's always the threat of uh, civil attacks, of course, also for uh, the whole reputation system itself. And um, yeah, that's why we could have these online pseudonymous parties, but also the uh, Lucy bots will help us with that. Uh, I don't know, William, do you know more about the Lucy bot? Uh, no, that's kind of not my specialty. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Tiago would be better to talk about this. Um, so, as of now, we're still in the early stage of this, but the idea is um, to not have humans rating each other, but that an AI bot is actually going to distribute the reputation tokens. And this AI will measure how much work you actually delivered in each contract. So, you cannot just have like many trans uh, contracts where you just send yourself one cent and then boost your reputation with many fake profiles. Um, the AI bot would measure the based on the smart contract parameters what was actually done. Um, of, of course, all of these things have to be on on a blockchain and able to to track this and to guarantee that it's the truth. Um, but yeah, we are um, doing this in order to prevent the reputation slavery because maybe you've seen Black Mirror. There was this one episode of the reputation slavery where basically people with the highest reputation. And just uh, yeah, do whatever they want, and everyone else has has to uh, like be close to them or to get points, and it's it's uh, like worse dictatorship than what we've ever seen, because yeah, you, you will just be based on on how uh, other people perceive you. So no, instead of this, we want meritocracy that actually rewards people for their work, and that is a bit more objective than than the yeah human corruption element. Let's say. Uh, if you just yeah have a lot of people who like you, and it's, it's like populism basically. Sure. So we want to prevent this kind of uh, abuse of, of reputation systems. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, regarding the team behind, uh, yeah, 
can you tell us more? Like, who is developing the machine? So, exactly for this, I created one slide here. So, um, I think we have over 15 developers already. Um, this needs to be updated, I think. Um, yeah, you can see William there on the left. He's a Solidity developer, and uh, Florian and Kent, they're basically uh, leading the whole uh, technology hold on. Um, and yeah, we, we have people working on, on many ends, like on the AI, on iOS and Android, um, UX, UI, um, the, the React that William mentioned before, um, JS, the websites, um, graphics, and yeah, basically for all, Florian is kind of evaluating possible integrations with uh, other open source blockchain projects uh, and kind of the yeah, software architect. Um, and yeah, but uh, potentially everyone could join this. You know, like for now, like I said, it's still a bit more uh, centralistic to start this up, but soon, uh, even this month, we will release the uh, public API and anyone can start to develop their own dApps on top of this and create their own business model also within uh, the BitNation ecosystem. So um, one idea, I mean, we will not do this immediately, but one idea is to, um, on top of the transaction fees that you pay for the Ethereum miners at the moment, you can have a small fee on top of this, and this will go, uh, like, if you scale this, you know, there will be potentially billions of users all over the world because people are all frustrated with how their governments work. Uh, and if you just have one service that everyone all over the world would use, like notaries, for example, that are much cheaper than the current bureaucratic government services, then you could scale this, and if just everyone around the world would just pay, I don't know, like 10 cents for this, you could already uh, make a really good business model out of this. Um, so, like we are very starting, uh, let's say, on the, on the small scale, and it's also, of course, very dependent on the network effect, but uh, our goal is really to uh, be as big as Facebook one day, because uh, essentially everyone could use uh, blockchain ID, they could use a BitNation passport that is completely independent from where they have been born. Uh, I didn't mention this before. So I know that there's um, the dichotomy between the whole pseudonymous element and the passports. So um, I can show you that um, we're also working on passports. Here. So um, people will be able to choose this voluntarily. They will not be forced to do this. But you could have a passport like you already have today with a picture, uh, but basically like the Estonian ID, like the Estonian ID cards. You will have uh, at the same time um, this ID gives you access to the wallet. So it's, uh, let's say, verified so who's the owner of this wallet. Um, you will have a QR code to scan this and to check the timestamp of this. Um, it also has the um, expiration date um, in order to make sure that uh, some authority is checking this. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Like, uh, of course, there will also be people who cannot do this because maybe they're uh, persecuted by the government, or maybe the government's prohibiting the use of BitNation, it's becoming illegal, and then we can no longer use this. Um, so we have to think of ways how to prove your uh, identity without using biometrics. And our founder also says if you put biometrics on the blockchain, that will lead to the next genocide. Because uh, if you have all the biometric data on the public ledger, uh, governments or specific uh, groups can just abuse this and target people or filter out people based on, uh, on, on, their, <coughs> on their race. Um, and yeah, in order to, do, to avoid this, there could be many things. Like one thing, like I mentioned before, is this uh, proof of individuality tokens with unnamed pseudonymous uh, parties. But another um, way to uh, somehow still prove yourself would be to, um, I don't know, to, to have some physical meetups where you verify that you're actual human beings. You don't have to tell each other's names, but you somehow scan each other's codes or something to and that's like a one, one time use, but there, there's many ideas how to do this. Uh, it could also be a signature. So um, you would have to um, write some phrases and based on your signature, it could be verified that it's actually you. 
uh, or it could be even the way you walk. Like everyone has a different way of walking, um, and could be like the, the pattern of your walking could be uh, like created as as the yeah as the pattern to, to recognize your identity, and uh, you cannot uh, you can still not track who this person actually is. You will just prove that you're yourself. So at the border, you will just walk, and then uh, you you can already prove that you're yourself. So there can be many different ideas on um, yeah, how to create passwords without biometrics. Uh, I think this is a very interesting field. And yeah, for us, everyone working on ID, it's like a big, big problem of how, how to get around biometrics. <laughs> Any more questions or, uh, I don't know, criticism, feedback, anything? <laughs> I think you should uh, focus a little bit on, on self sovereign ID. Yeah. And all different options for that. Mm. Because basically, it's not putting biometrics on the blockchain. Basically, you, you just put hashes on the blockchain, and then the biometrics, they, they are owned by, by, the, by the people. So I have the service that can be by my biometrics with nobody else. But so, uh, where is the storage? Uh, there's different ways of storing that. So that's the problem there. <laughs> Uh, if it's in a the cloud, then of course no, it's again. Be in the cloud. Yeah. Uh, if you have it yourself, then of course there's uh, the problem of losing the data. Um, but it's it's not a problem basically because there's, there's there are a lot of recovery systems when you're mm -hmm. using uh, like RC seventy five or or even you pour, you can recover your own ID and then all you need is like to have backup, encrypted backup somewhere with your data and that's it. Okay. It's not perfect, but it's yeah, but it's something. So in this year C seventy five, how how is it working? Uh it's basically a smart contract with a list of keys and a list of claims, mm -hmm. and it uses deeds, decentralized IDs, and this is the standard for for a global digital ID right now that mm -hmm. most of the people is working on. So I think it would be good if you work with a uh, uh, so it's, it's standard like RC twenty four tokens mm -hmm. and RC seventy five it's for. Uh, for digital ideas. There is probably a project that uh, have like authentication over the blockchain, I guess, right? Yeah, many of them. Like, the yeah. integrating a uh, service will be easier than reinventing the wheel because yeah. it's, it's a complicated problem on its own. So I don't think it would be both. But also one problem with uh, the solutions like Viewport, it's also uh, like a consensus project and it's completely dependent on Ethereum. Uh, and we don't want to be dependent on one blockchain, we want to be blockchain agnostic. So we, we need to also find a solution that is uh, independent of Ethereum. But then it's, it's, it's a standard that's not yeah. blockchain dependent. Okay. Maybe. I, I'm also not a big fan of people. Mm. It's not really decentralized. But you okay. should take a look at the standards. Yeah, and the idea, I think it's it's... Sometimes we have some exponential technology, but cultural barriers are uh, we cannot move that time. And I think with identification to to scale up, I think it's easier. I don't know. I guess because you're talking about yeah. nations, yeah, yeah, yeah for not sure. entities. Of course. Right? Um, so yeah, I mean, for that's why also we, we have nations because it's also a representation of cultures, right? Like for us, it's not like uh, like borders on the map or something like this. It's more about uh, how you identify yourself and it's something that transcends borders and that is actually becoming more and more global, especially like digital natives, you know, um, they, they have, they identify themselves with cultures that are on the internet. Like they, they don't need to be I don't know, like living in the U.S. to feel mm -hmm. I don't know part of the hip hop group or whatever. Like uh, you, you can feel uh, things without uh, actually being in one geographical location. So uh, we are in a moment where you can now, uh, apart from being just like mm -hmm. saying you're you're part of the scene or culture or whatever, mm -hmm. now you can actually join a virtual nation with the code, with a constitution, uh, with with services that they actually offer to each other. Um, to to live this uh, to live this culture like apart from from just uh, saying but also from from actual like agreements and business and everything. And this nation is made by or for people, right? 
There's, I mean, there's no machine. But um, again, peer to peer. So I went to one uh, IoT hackathon and it was interesting to see what kind of uh, potential there would be for a machine nation. Um, so for now, actually, it would be possible to, for a bot to just create also a nation, to create a constitution. And I think it's actually also part of the exoparticles that we're creating. So uh, there, there's room for actual uh, bot users. We also will have uh, chatbots for, for the whole smart contract creation. Um, and I think that's, that's why it will be no need for identification. I mean, um, th that's why it will also be important to have these uh, proof of individuality tokens to be able to distinguish between bots and, and actual humans. Um, and, but they, they can also serve uh, like people in a very good way by using machine learning to, to um, like better adapt to, to what the market needs and to yeah, be yeah, like, no, faster to adopt. That's your, your point of view about interacting if this nation is just for people or also machines and so it's, it's also for, uh, like, potentially, they, they can also be bots, like, uh, because it's pseudonymous and there's nothing uh, yeah, stopping so you no, from no creating bots. I think there's actually already one, one chatbot, like mm -hmm. a Freud bot or Do something. Do you have C-Standing? Um, we're, we're talking to C-Standing, to the C-Standing. Yeah, it makes, it makes sense. I mean, uh, actually, we, we're um, now in touch with this uh, first French Polynesia con uh, <coughs> project that they have for the first season mm -hmm. is that yeah. and they would also like to, to use blockchain of course as the backend for this um, and I think for every uh, self-sovereign mm -hmm. project I think they, they would like to have blockchain also as the administration to uh, eliminate the bureaucracy you know of all of this and which competitors or a uh, group of people working the same so um, it's difficult to pinpoint competitors because we, we at the one side, we're basically a new chat app, like uh, Telegram, Signal, and so on. But on the other side, uh, we are also creating a DApp store. So um, Suzanne said once that uh, Status IAM is one competitor because they also have many applications for uh, the Ethereum platform. It's also going through a chat interface. But uh, in my opinion, uh, there's no, like, Competitor, competitors specifically doing jurisdictions as a service, like us. Mm -hmm. So everyone is working inside of the existing uh, nation-state jurisdictions, not creating new. I mean, only Aragon is uh, creating, like you know, this DAO and uh, allows people to incorporate on blockchain, but it's not specifically creating uh, a market for laws and uh, you know, competing jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Cool, great. Uh, Eric, do you still need me here? Um, I think we're fine. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks for your explanation. Okay, see you. See you. Bye. Um, yeah, so do you have any more like specific questions, not about the code, but let's say about the project itself? Because uh, usually I have a lot of questions about our um, political roadmap. I mean, this is just the... Uh, technological sites, but if we want to make this real, mm, we also have to face that there are still nation states. You know, uh, just like with, with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, uh, BitNation could also uh, become subject to regulation. So, um, one idea that uh, we have with, uh, like, I'm a um, member of the Ambassador Holland, and so ideally we will also not have, uh, we will not only have uh, good ambassadors, but also diplomatic ambassadors to talk to. Uh, nation state representatives to um, basically negotiate for our citizens' rights and um, to also allow people to exchange physical goods because at the moment we're still kind of limited to uh, virtual exchanges because uh, as soon as you want to, for example, sell a house on the blockchain that is outside of the current nation state law, um, when, when, yeah, I'm a trickster, I could easily just say all of these laws are wrong and when someone comes to take my house, I would just call the police and say this is an invader and this contract is invalid because it's uh, against the current nation-state law. Um, so, yeah, in order to, to allow um, people to use the full uh, opportunities from this, uh, we will also have to be recognized by nation-states, actually. And uh, in order to get there, I was thinking of one 
um, one thing to do is by uh, basically offering nation states to put their also to create virtual nations on this platform. So instead of just saying it's us or them, or it's like uh, you know, like a question of who, who will who will survive or who will die. No, we can also live in coexistence um, because. Right now, Estonia already started this by being the first nation to go digital. They're very advanced in civic tech. They have the Estonian uh, ID, and people can already incorporate in Estonian law without actually being able to enter the European Union. So, for example, someone from Zimbabwe could use the uh, tax laws in Estonia uh, and could actually, yeah, live completely independent from where he was born. So that's like the, the way to go, I think. And for other nations together, um, they could use us basically to to uh, do the whole uh, technological work to um, yeah basically um, to to get into this market. So uh, we can help them to offer voluntary services. The only requirement that we have is that all services that are provided on this uh, the app store um, they should be voluntary. Like we will never uh, allow anything that forces people to, to join a nation or based on, on where you have been born because we are about uh, transcending this geographical apartheid to allow people, uh, no matter where they have been born, to access high quality governance services and to not exclude people based on, on where they just happen to be born. So on the iOS app, I see, I guess, China is one of the newest nations. Really? Uh, I'm assuming <laughs> that's not the, not the real China. So, I mean, if the real China sees this and obviously says this is my uh, this is not this is not us. How would what's the, how would they go about claiming this nation or kicking this nation off? Or, I mean, how would they do that? <laughs> so uh, here you can also see like there's all kinds of nations already. Also, Republica Catalana, which is really interesting because. Uh, it's a way for people to opt out from, from the Spanish government without having to fight the actual Spanish institutions. They can just, yeah, go pseudonymous and do their thing. Uh, they could have their own contract law. They could just evolve in this direction. Um, China can do nothing about this because it's uh, pseudonymous. Like, they cannot track if this was actually done by Chinese citizens. Um, of course, one thing is the back and the other thing is the front end. So, um, <coughs> If you're like new to all of this cryptography and so on, and, uh, you, you're using, I don't know, a device that has keyloggers, or if you have like loopholes in your uh, cybersecurity, then of course there's a threat. So we, we can just provide a secure backend, but you will still have to care about the front end. Um, so yes, there's of course still the danger that uh, like autocratic uh, regimes can, uh, can still like track you if you don't take care of your um, physical hardware uh, device that you use to interface with, uh, to yeah, to, to interact with this. Um, but I think um, sooner or later, like all nations will want to go in this direction because it's an additional rev revenue stream. Actually, if you think about it, because now nations are limited to their uh, like geographical boundaries, but uh, if you open up to this global market, uh, you can get a lot of new clients. And uh, also, it will cut their own costs. Like they can also uh, save money from all their internal administration by just using blockchain. And if there is already an uh, external provider, why, why wouldn't they want to use it? So, yeah. Any more questions? They just couldn't call themselves China because that was already taken. Um, <laughs> I mean, everyone know that there's actually right now no no limit. That's maybe a problem, but also a good thing because it's not like domain names. Like uh, once it's taken, you can know. For example, you can just create a new Republica Catalana. There's already different uh, Catalonia 2.0. Um, so you could say uh, like in the same geographic area that you would like to represent or culture that you would like to represent, you can have different constitutions, different ideologies, and it's not, uh, it's not backed by military or police or whatever. Uh, it's, it's basically you're selling an idea. Um, and the, the idea is just to, to uh, have your target audience with this name. But also people outside of this, uh, like also non-Chinese people, also non-Catalan people can join these nations. 
it's it's not like restricted by geographical borders. It's borderless. That's why we call the nations DBVNs, decentralized borderless voluntary nations. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, of course, it's a problem if we have like five thousand Chinas, and you will have to find out uh, which one is the real one or which one is the, the best one. Uh, so one thing to do this would be, uh, of course, the reputation system. You will see which one has the best reputation. But also there will be the exocortex that kind of uh, um, like helps you or recommends you. It's, it's a uh, machine learning recommendation system that uh, helps you, even though uh, you will not give away your physical identity, but based on your uh, public key and on your actions on the app, it will recommend you which um, like business partners you would prefer based on your ideology, based on your uh, like law, um, let's say ideas about how, how law should look like, or which kind of laws you accept. Um, I think we, we can go in this direction to make this whole free market more uh, yeah, easier to navigate. Because when there's like millions of options, it would be great to, to have some yeah, uh, interface. So, uh, like with, with, with internet, with internet, we're waiting for Google, right, to make the whole thing uh, more, yeah, uh, easier to interact with. And uh, we need the same for blockchain, actually, to to make the whole thing easier to navigate. Guys, <laughs> I suggest right now we just go down. There's a brewery down there, so I think we can just go on there, take a beer. Right. Yeah. Okay. So thanks everyone for coming. Mm -hmm.